first, a very basic question. What uh, is your work for which you received the most recognition? Uh, I've got the Turing Award uh, for my work on reduced instruction set computers, a risk. Uh, this, it's not a very hard idea. <laughs> It was just very controversial at the time. So basically, when software talks to hardware, there's a vocabulary so that the hardware can understand it. And uh, Hennessy's and my notion was contrary to the prevailing wisdom, which at the time you thought you needed a very rich vocabulary to, for software to talk to hardware. And our idea was instead to have a very simple vocabulary, uh, not a lot of words and very simple words. Uh, then the technical question was, when you read these words, if they're more complicated, you wouldn't need as many, but how fast could you read them? Mm -hmm. And it turned out you had to read about 25% more instructions of the simple instructions than the complicated ones, but we could read them about five times faster, so the net effect was about a factor of four better. So uh, that's why uh, you know, today 99% of processors are risk processors. Now you say it was controversial at the time. Uh, were there predecessors? Were there papers, for example, or, or um, people whose work uh, inspired you to follow this path? Uh, papers, not so much. Uh, you know, John and I both uh, started research projects at our two universities where we asked, well, what makes sense for microprocessors? Uh, we'd seen what the larger computers, the mainframes and mini computers, have done, but didn't, shouldn't we? Let's start from first principles to do that. There was an earlier project at IBM led by John Koch, who was also a Turing Award winner, who uh, had the idea of simpler instruction sets for bigger computers. So that was a precedent of our work. But unfortunately, they weren't allowed to write papers about what they did. So it was kind of a, a, a rumor. <laughs> and uh, John Koch would visit us and inspire us. But yeah, this, it was more what makes sense for microprocessors and what got us going. So, uh, is this your first HLF? Yes, my first HLF. We just got the award in March, and so it's my first chance. Oh, that's right. You're, you're the, the newest. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're the, I'm the newbie. <laughs> yes. Um, and when did you get in? Uh, oh, I came in Wednesday, so today's uh, Monday. So, yeah, four days ago, yeah. So, you've had a chance to interact a little bit with the students and... Yeah. Uh, well, mostly last night. Uh, it, there was a, a German 50th anniversary party and, uh, for ACM, and that was the earlier event. Not too many students were there. So, do you have any expectations or hopes for the event? No, I was came to uh, and see what it was like, uh, but it was kind of fun. Uh, there was a woman from Nigeria who was uh, sampled on the opening ceremony and asked her what she wanted to do, and she said she wanted to see Dave Patterson. <laughs> so, so I went out of my way to make sure we uh, connected last night, so that fulfilled her wish, <laughs> and we talked about you know uh, what she's teaching in Nigeria and. Uh, whether there are some ideas I could help her with, point her to some uh, course material and, uh, to help her out. So that was fun. So uh, going back to, to how you got started, um, were there any specific mentors? Uh, I mean, we talked a little yeah. bit about, uh, and who were they and how did they? they well, what, you know, uh, as I think when I uh, give my talk, I'm gonna I'll give my life story there, but I had no plans to go to graduate school or study computer science. I was a math major, and there was not yet an undergraduate degree in computer science. So as a math major, uh, in the end of my junior year, a course was canceled, so I had to take something. So I took a computer course and loved it. And then in the middle of my senior year, I took a course uh, and, from, and did well, and just casually mentioned to the instructor that, Boy, I'd sure rather be doing this. I was working part time in a, kind of in a factory to support myself as I went through school, and I'd sure rather do computer science than work in a factory. And said it completely innocently. And he went and found me a job as an undergraduate. And as a result of that, I started working with graduate students, and that got me interested in going to grad school. And uh, I talked to my wife into, well, a master's degree seems pretty cost efficient. And then I was in a a room with four students, the other three were all getting PhDs, so that seemed like a good idea. But if had that, you know, faculty member had on his own found me a job, uh, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have gone to grad school because I had no plans to do it. So it changed my life. And where was this? 
at UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And who is the who is the? Well, he was a, just a PhD student at the time, but his name is Jean Loubert, and he became a professor at uh, the University of Washington. Uh, just after he helped me out, he, he had to hang around UCLA for a while, really, while he was looking for a job, so he's teaching that course. Mm -hmm. Now I know that you you were at Berkeley for a long time, yes? Yes, forty years. Yes. How did you approach? Uh, uh, teaching and mentorship and promising young students? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I felt it was, it depended, you know, for undergraduates, you know, they needed more direction. Uh, I, and I, of course, looked for opportunities to return the favor that happened to me to get them involved with research. For graduate students, I consider them kind of like young colleagues, right, as they're they're clearly very smart if they get into graduate school at Berkeley and just don't have a lot of experience. And so my idea was what I tried to do is create research projects that if I was a student, I'd just die to work on them. i make it in what I would think would be an incredibly exciting project from the, from the student's perspective and then get them involved and let them find their passion and what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you, uh, uh, how the people here at the HLF have been, but of course you, you've only been here for a short time. Yeah, so they it's seem interesting people, <laughs> uh, certainly excited about what they're working on. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, encourage excitement? Well, I think I'm kind of naturally a cheerleader <laughs> uh, and uh, an optimistic person and kind of a lot of energy, so I, I think I can I get, I inspire people to uh, want to work on things. I think that's one of my, part of my skill set. I was a, uh, I did sports, I still do uh, a lot of sports, and so I kind of use the, the mental model of a coach who's there to help you, help pe young people achieve to the best of their abilities. So that, that's what I think of myself. Now the environment that they're in is very different from the one that you were in, certainly as far as the content, um, and perhaps... You mean the, the HLF students? Or? I mean, in general, uh, anybody of that age who's entering computer architecture, for example. Right. Um, what do you think are the most important differences between then and now? Between when I started and now? Yeah. Uh, as I'll say in my lecture, the biggest thing is the end of Moore's Law. Is for 50 years, there's been Moore's Law where the number of transistors would double every year or two. So that's, you know, you were, it was like skeet shooting, right? You tried to lead uh, a couple of years that when the technology is going to be available, which was, uh, uh, if you design for today, it'd be antiquated in a couple of years. So you have to guess where the technology is going to be. But shockingly, uh, that's over. In fact, when I say that, on Thursday, people aren't going to believe me because they've heard people say Moore's Law is over, but it's, it's over. <laughs> so we can't count on that anymore. Um, and so we're going to have to rely more on computer architects to come up with new ideas how to do better computers, even though the transistors are, haven't, aren't going to get much better. So this is going to be even a greater challenge going forward. I know I'm probably asking you to repeat things you're going to give in your talk, but this won't come out until after your talk, sure. so I hope you don't feel. <laughs> um, so what do, what do you think are the, the most promising areas to follow? Yeah, well, well since uh, Hennessy and I just uh, got the award, I guess six months ago, we wanted to make that part of our Turing lecture, is to lay out uh, challenges and opportunities. So the challenges are the, the ending of Moore's Law. There's another thing called Denard scaling, where um, you know, it used to be that you could make, put more transistors in because they didn't use more energy. The voltage would drop and they could fit that in, but that's over. So power is now a limit. So two big things we counted upon are over. Uh, the opportunities we think are, uh, we've got these new modern programming languages like Python, which are really productive for programmers, but they're really inefficient on hardware. So doing some kind of compiler hardware innovations to make these modern programming languages run faster seems like a big opportunity. Uh, in uh, another thing that we've had kind of run out of ideas, given the end of Moore's Law and given the end of Denard scaling, how to make general purpose computers go faster. That they're hardly improving at all. Uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, they were doubling in performance every 18 months thanks to new ideas in Moore's Law. And people would throw away their laptops, not that they were broken, it's just they were so slow relative to their friend's laptop, they didn't want to use it anymore. Well, that, that year was long, long past us. So as far as architects are concerned, the only way forward 
of making hardware faster is to narrow the domain that they work on. So not general purpose processors, but domain specific architectures is the phrase that's being used. Hmm. What sort of applications do you think are most appropriate for, for such architectures? Uh, the one that's getting the most excitement right now is machine learning, neural networking. So that particular domain, uh, everybody's talking about it. I was talking to a, a PhD candidate who uh, who was uh, visited a bunch of conferences, and no matter what conference he went to, computer architecture theory, the most uh, excitement at the session was the machine learning session. So for all fields, people are excited about learning about machine learning for its potential. Uh, um, since you, machine learning has a tremendous appetite for computing, uh, what the uh, issue is going forward, and CPUs aren't getting much faster, we're going to ne need new architectures for machine learning. So it's a very exciting area right now. Optimized uh, uh, hardware. Hardware optimized for machine learning to accelerate the rate of machine learning. Wow, wow. That actually uh, answers the next thing that I was thinking of asking, which is what do you think are the, uh, what, uh, well, what are the things in the next five years? But actually in the last five years, what do you think has, uh, has had the greatest impact aside from the ending of Moore's law? Um, no, I, I would say, uh, in the last five years, I don't know that there's been, it's been more kind of the ending of things than rather some great new thing that's happened. Well, I, no, let me change that answer. Uh, a thing that we were doing at Berkeley, another thing I'm going to talk about, is a brand new thing for computer architecture, which is to borrow ideas of the open source movement of machine uh, from uh, like Linux operating systems. So, uh, so far, all of the, uh, what's called the instruction sets, this vocabulary, that I talked about early have been proprietary. So the most popular are owned by Intel and ARM. The new idea is to develop a, a risk instruction set that nobody owns, uh, that anybody can use, and so that all companies can embrace. So this idea has been around about uh, three or four years now, and so we started up like the Linux Foundation. It's called Risk Five for the Fifth Risk Project. So it's the Risk Five Foundation, and it has hundreds of, you know, 200 members now. So it's very rapidly increasing in popularity, so there's a lot of excitement about the idea of an open architecture like there are open operating systems. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, interest in following this among, among young researchers? Yes, um, uh, particularly it's, there's a tremendous excitement in China around RISC-V. Uh, there's interest in the security community. One of the advantages of RISC-V since it's open is anybody can use it and you can make changes to it. Uh, and put it out there yourself. So in the past, when the, with only proprietary instruction sets, you have to kind of beg ARM or Intel to put your ideas in, but with RISC-V you could do it yourself, put it up on the network and see how well they work because it has a real software stack and you know you can get users and everything. So it's really dramatically increasing the number of people who can do computer architecture research. Uh, you, you don't have to work with, it with one or two companies now. Now if I'm going to move again away from your work and back to back to the students here and mentorship and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I know this is your first time, so it's sort of hard to, to gauge, but what do you hope that they get from you? Get from me? Uh, well, that computer architecture is an exciting area. <laughs> Uh, that uh, it's, you know, there's been some times recently where things seem to be moving pretty slowly that, you know, that industry uh, was where you had to work in industry to, to be able to affect what was going on and the fact that it's really blossomed and, you know, Hennessy and I, the title of our Turing lecture is A New Golden Age. We think it's going to be another exciting era for, in computer architecture. And if you, you know, even if you're outside of computer architecture, if you need things to go faster to be more energy efficient, you're going to need to work with computer architects to deliver that because you know, Moore's Law is no more. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, a question you think should have been asked but wasn't perhaps? A question that should have been asked? Um, Uh, I'm not, uh, no, I guess the answer is no. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. And thank you again for making okay. the time. I hope you enjoy the, the conference. Yeah, thank you.